and welcome to The Art of Being Human. In the last segment, I talked to you about uh, emotions. I talked to you about the definition of what psychology is. And so I want to continue with the emotions today. And I mentioned to you before that emotions are actually states of being. They're not just feelings. So let me get started and do some more work with emotions so you'll understand them better. Uh, everybody has emotions. Everybody has a lot of emotions, and we vary. We go up and down. You know, we can have days when we feel good one minute and sad the next moment, and we just go up and down with our emotions. But that's all right, because everybody has emotions, and we cannot say that emotions are good or bad. We normally think about that. If you're angry, that's bad. If you're not angry and you're happy, that's good. But we should not class emotions like that because emotions can be physiological responses to things that's happening to us. And if we're angry, well, there are some times when we should be angry. We should be angry at bullying. We should be angry at people who hurt other people. There is a definite reason to be angry. And the Bible even says, be angry, but sin not. In other words, learn how to handle your anger. But it's not necessarily bad to be angry. Emotions are not the same as your character and your disposition and your personality. Your character, your disposition, your personality, these are more deep-seated. You know, when you're talking about emotions, emotions are temporary. Emotions come and go. I can be happy at one moment. I can be sad the next moment. I can be really joyous about something and yet be angry about something on the same day, sometimes the same minute. This is typical. This is just human behavior, and this is just typical. But, you know, with, uh, when you're talking about disposition, this is what you usually are. Are you usually good to people? Are you usually nice to people? Are you usually presenting yourself in a certain kind of way that they can depend upon because they know you're going to be in a certain way when they see you? You're always pleasant or you're always nice or you're always angry, whatever it is. That would have to do with your disposition. Your character is the deepest part of you, in a sense. Are you, what are your morals? What are your moral basis? What do you believe in? How do you treat people? You're going to treat people the way that you believe. If you believe that people are, are worthy of respect, no matter who they are, no matter what their, their uh, problems are, then that's a part of your character, and you're going to behave that way toward people. So people get to depend upon you to behave in a certain kind of way. I know it's important for therapists to have a way about them so they present themselves in a certain way. So no matter when a person comes in for counseling or how often you see that person, and you may see a person for a very long period of time, they can always depend upon you to be the same. The same in the way that you react to them. The same in the character that you show. The same in the compassion that you show. And even though you may be confrontive toward them sometimes because sometimes they need that. Your character doesn't necessarily change. You're still compassionate. You're still interested in them. You still are warm toward them. And a good, a good therapist will be that way. They're not changeable. Now, the value of that in therapy is the fact that people need to know that when they see a person who is supposed to be helping them, that they can depend upon them to be a certain way, and they can rely upon them to always be warm toward them, comforting toward them, interested in them, and that they can depend upon that because, you see, healing uh, occurs in terms of relationships. Healing is involved with relationships. If you are a person that is stable and steadfast and a person who is emotionally distraught because they have a mental illness or something else is going on in their life comes to see you and they see that no matter what you are, what day it is, your personality is basically the same, your characteristics are basically the same, you're not up and down, you know, you're not emotional emotional one day and then cold the next. You have a steady, steadfast type of personality. They get to lean on that. 
And when they lean on that, they get to develop their own character. And that's a part of the healing process. There is healing in relationships, and they always need to remember that. So if you're involved in helping somebody else, and who isn't? So I'm extending this, not just in terms of a therapeutic relationship, but if you're involved with helping somebody else, no matter what their circumstances are, you need to be solid and steady and stable so they can, real, so they can uh, just uh, rely upon you to be the same. It's like you are the lifeboat and they're reaching out for the lifeboat and they're holding on to the lifeboat. But you're there and you're steady and you're stable so they can do that. And then they grow by that and they heal by that. So part of the aspects of healing in any therapeutic relationship is that you are solid, steady, stable, someone that can be relaxed relied upon. When you say you're going to be there, you're there. You don't just suddenly not show up for appointments and, you know, you, you just need to be stable and someone that can be relied upon. So the emotions here again are not the same as your character or your disposition or your personality. Personality, by the way, is the total you. Everything that concerns you, the way you act, the way you are, the way you present yourself, uh, the things that you like to do, the things that you don't like to do, your hobbies, the things that are important to you, your belief system, it's all a part of your personality. The personality is everything about you that's totally you, including your politics and everything else. That's your, your personality, totally you. Emotions are transitory, they're up and down, and so therefore they can't be relied upon as being, as showing the true character of the person that you're dealing with or showing your own true character. Because our emotions can become our reality. If we're hurt, if we've been abused, if we have a problem, our emotions become our reality. And we have fear, supposing, for example, that you've been abused. And the more you're abused, the more this affects you. If you're abused once, it's bad, and, and there's no excuse for abuse ever. But if you're abused once, you can recover from that. But if it continues in a pattern, and most often it does, then what happens is that you develop all kinds of emotions and fear concerning the abuse. And then you get to fear your fear. You know, uh, Winston Churchill says, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Well, in a way, that's true. If I've been hit by a person, and I'm not saying this has ever happened because it happened, has never happened, but just in case, just as an example, supposing I've been hit by a person slapped across the face or punched out or something, then and supposing this happens on a periodic basis because it's somebody that's bullying me or abusing me, then what is likely to happen is I'm going to develop a fear. I'm going to develop a fear of that person who's doing it. I'm going to try to stay away from that person who's doing it. And then I'm going to develop a fear of my reaction, which is fear. So I'm fearful because of the abuse, and then what's going to happen to my personality? I am now going to become fearful of the fear. And what if I went into a treatment, supposing a child is abused, they don't, may not remember the abuse, but supposing that it happened a long time ago, they remember the fear that they felt. And then they are going to develop a fear of fear. And then that's kind of a secondary situation. So when they go into counseling, what do they want? I got to get rid of this fear. I don't know what's happening to me, but I'm fearful all the time. I have to get rid of it. It's interfering with my life. Do you know what you're afraid of? I don't know. My life is perfect. What they don't realize is that fear came from way, way before, and they have lost their memory of it, but what they do remember is the reaction to it, and they fear that reaction, so they have a fear 
of the fear that they developed without getting in touch with what caused that fear to begin with. I don't know if this makes any sense to you, but you stop to think of it. The human body is very good at forgetting things which are painful. You would think that they would remember, but they don't. We force down into our subconscious things which are painful because we don't want to remember them. It's too painful to remember them, so we don't do it. So what happens instead? Well, we go ahead and we have the reactions to what we were afraid of, and the reactions remain. And the reason the reactions remain is that it's never been resolved. So you've been hit, you've been abused, you've been bullied. Then what happens? You have a fear of all of that, but it happened at a young age. Your body does not want to remember it. Your mind does not want to remember it. You put it in your unconscious. Now, you don't do this deliberately. You don't wake up one day and say, you know, I'm going to force forget all of this. But your brain does it for you. You don't have a choice. Your brain forgets it. It puts it in the deep unconscious. Now, it's not gone. It's still there. But you don't have a conscious memory of it because it's in your subconscious. Then you get into a situation that's a little bit similar and maybe abuse is not involved, but it feels a little to you like it was way back when. And you don't remember what happened way back when because it was unconscious. It became unconscious, but you still have that fear reaction. And so something triggers you. It, uh, the way a person talks to you, if a person put their hand on their shoulder, on your shoulder or something, you just have this fear reaction and it gets, it gets magnified and suddenly you become very afraid. You don't know what you're afraid of, but you know you're very afraid. You go into treatment and you say, I have this horrible fear, I can't get rid of it. I need help in getting rid of it. Well, there's no such thing as a symptom without a cause. And so therefore, the, the therapist would say, do you have any recollection, anything that would have caused you to have this fear? And you'll say, no, I don't have any recollection. Suddenly, I just become afraid. Certain times, I become afraid. So the therapist now has to piece together why you are afraid. Now, as I said before, psychology is not a study of the mind. It's a study of observable behavior. But what the person does is he's telling you, I'm afraid. That's observable behavior. Speech is observable behavior. So the therapist knows just by inference that something has happened to cause you to have that fear. The therapist doesn't know what it is either because they weren't there at the time. So piece by piece you unravel all of this like you unravel an onion layer by layer by layer and then it becomes obvious what happened and then you treat that. But you see how why therapy takes such a long time is because you cover up the emotions that you had that were difficult with layers and layers and layers of something that will kind of protect yourself from knowing what it was, what the bad thing was. You protect yourself from knowing and you layer on whatever it is you layer on. But you still have the emotions. Why do you have the emotions? It's because nothing was ever uh, resolved. Absolutely nothing was ever resolved. And because it was not resolved, the end product, which is the fear, is still there. And it's always going to be there until it does get resolved. And so therefore, you have to work at it and work at it. Otherwise, you can be living with this emotion for the rest of your life. So it behooves us to find out what it is that we struggled with. Now, I know a lot of people say that they don't like psychology because you're always digging into the past. But that's exactly the reason why you're digging into the past, because something happened. You can't find it. You don't know what it is. Your mind has protected itself against it. But you are suffering the results of that. The fear results that you got at the time that the abuse occurred never ended because it wasn't resolved. So once it's resolved and you understand it and you can put it in a different perspective, then you lose that anger response and that fear response and then the problem is over with. So it does take a long time. Emotions, we have to be careful of them, we have to deal with them, and we have to remember that's not our true character, but it's something that we deal with 
with daily, and sometimes we have problems with that. Our emotions are temporary and they're transitory, and we believe that our emotions are our true selves, and our emotions are not our true selves, but they may as well be because that's what we're dealing with in the present. When you are reliving an emotion that causes you fear, that fear becomes your reality because all you can think about is that fear and how to handle the fear. But, you know, it, it, at the same time, there's a reason for it, and you need to dig down to find it. So emotions are just a small part of your personality. I think, Rick, what we'll do is get that first chart up, and we'll go over that. I have a chart here that uh, we'll put on the screen, and it's, uh, it has, I called it the cycle of fear, and I mention is that there's no such thing as a symptom without a cause. Something happens to you, it can happen to you once or it can happen to you repeatedly, and you react with the symptoms of fear, anxiety, or worry that it's going to continue to occur. And then the anxiety symptoms become your reality because you look at it as truth. What you say is, I am that fear. And not that I have a symptom of fear, but I am that fear. And then that becomes your reality. And then you wish to stop the symptoms, and then you seek treatment to stop the symptoms. And so therefore, I think what we'll do now is also look at that second chart what you need to understand is, and I'll embellish this a little bit, you don't assume that all of your fears are completely accurate. When you develop a fear, you, as you grow, your fear kind of twists. It becomes a little inaccurate. And what you think is what you tell your brain. The brain will assume that what you're thinking is truthful, and you will experience the emotions of it, and you think that that's your truth and your reality. You need to realize that the more you analyze that fear, if you're not getting help with it, the more you dig a hole for yourself and the more difficult it becomes. And you need to have relief by understanding that your fear is not your reality and your brain cannot tell the difference between a real and imagined thing. So let me go on with this. We have a few minutes left, so let me go on with this. Something's happened to you. I just want to explain anxiety a little, and I'll be continuing with this on the next segment as well. Something has happened to you. It may have happened once. It may have happened several times. It may have gone on for years. It may have been a pattern. And you have great fear and anxiety about that which happened to you, no matter what it was. It could have been an accident where you were injured. It could have been when a loved one died. It could have been when you were bullied. It could have been when you were abused. It could have been anything, some kind of a social circumstance. You had such anxiety about it that you developed fears around it. Then as you grew older, those fears were still there because you hadn't resolved the issue. The issue became hidden or it came into your subconscious or whatever, but you still have the issue of the fear. And then you've, the fear is so strong, it takes on a life of its own. It may become twisted. It may, may mean that you don't remember things exactly accurately, but you do know one thing, you're afraid. And that fear becomes your reality, and you live that fear, and you can sometimes live that fear every day. And as a result of that, your life is based upon the fear without your ever knowing what it was that caused the fear to begin with. When you get to the point where you can unravel it and understand where it came from, then you can get true healing from it because it becomes released. It's not something you're hiding anymore. It's not something that your brain is causing you to hide anymore. It's something that's out in the open. And when something is open, then the healing can begin because then it's not a secret. You don't have to spend energy trying to contain it, uh, trying to hide it. Your brain does that. It spends a lot of energy trying to hide things, but you no longer have to do that because it's out in the open and then you can deal with it. You can have people help you deal with it. You can realize that people are not judging you because you've been abused in your past and then you can go on with life. Now I've got more to say about this, but we've just about run out of time and I don't want to get into something that I can't quite finish and so what I'm going to do is close it here and we'll continue 
with us next time. Please join me then.